going to call that the second greatest story ever told. I don't know if it really is or not, but even if if somebody's never been to church a day in their life, they've probably heard the story of David and Goliath. We use it in metaphor uh, all the time. The underdog, it's the ultimate underdog story, David and Goliath. Normally, we motor through an entire chapter, you know, 40, 50 verses. I, I enjoy just plowing through as fast as we can. We're going to actually hit the brakes and slow down on the story of David and Goliath and, and just take it a little more slowly. So we're only going to do about 11 verses today. Now, if you've got your Bible and you want to turn to 1 Samuel 17, that's where we're going to be. Uh, we'll be a few other places as well, and it'll be on the screens. So I want you to imagine that you're standing on top of a hill, and the sun is kind of warm on your back. It's sunset, though. And that that long kind of purple shadow is starting to go across the valley in front of you and make its way up the hillside on the other side as you're facing west. And on your side of the valley, as the shadow goes down over the valley, you see kind of a hodgepodge of tents and campfires and things just kind of scattered all over the place. And, and, and the shadow moves across, and then there's a stream running down the middle of the valley. And then the shadow starts, you know, as you stand there longer, it starts going up the other side. And as you follow the shadow up the other side of the mountain, you see five sections of very neatly organized tents, all in rows, all the same. A big, large tent in the middle, campfires all in a row. You're standing on the Israelite side of the brook, And you're looking across at the five armies of the Philistines from their five cities. And they're all in their sections, and they know everything there is to know about war at this time. They're one of the most powerful armies in this region. And they have gathered at full strength. And you're looking over here on your own side. And it doesn't look very organized. There's maybe a tent that's a little bit nicer than than some of the other tents kind of there in the middle and and some soldiers standing around it. And that's where King Saul is, your king. Maybe his son Jonathan's in there with him. And over on the other side at that big tent, I can imagine the, the, the five lords of the Philistines from Ekron and Gath and Gaza, those five cities, uh, they're all coming in with their armor, right? And sitting down at the table and, you know, putting a knife in the table with a thud and they've got their their goblet of ale and a a leg of mutton. You know, these are big burly guys with great big beards and they take their helmets off and and they, what are we going to do today? How are we going to defeat these Hebrews once and for all? And they're having their strategy meeting in that tent over there. And you might be asking yourself, if you're standing on this side of the, of the valley and you're looking at that side of the valley, you might say, why are we here? How did we get to this point? And you might even have a, a hint of frustration when you ask that. Because really, neither army should be camped on either side of this mountain. Because you had a chance two chapters earlier to wipe these guys out. If you've been here for the whole study, you you can reflect. Chapter 14, they had a chance. But their leader, Saul, who's in that tent now trying to figure out what to do, he had made a foolish vow, and he said, nobody's going to be allowed to eat until I am avenged of the Philistines. And so if chapter 14, verse 31 says, they chased and killed Philistines all day from Michmash to Ahajalon, growing more and more faint. The army just got more and more weak throughout the day because he had made this foolish vow uh, and nobody was allowed to eat. And then you, if you remember the story, his son Jonathan, who had defeated an entire garrison that morning, actually found some honey in the woods. And he wasn't there when his dad made the announcement, nobody's allowed to eat till we've beaten the Philistines. And, and he ate some honey. And, and so then later in the day, Saul says, let's just chase Philistines and kill them all all night long. It'll be great. And, and somebody says, let's stop and pray about it. And uh, when they're having the prayer, they realize, no, somebody has sinned or gone against the oath or the vow. And, and it, they find out it was Jonathan and, and Saul and, and, and that really strange interchange. He's willing to kill his own son because he's made this oath that anybody who eats is going to die. 
And remember, the people actually step in between. The soldiers, they kind of step in between Jonathan and Saul, his father, and they say, you're not killing him. He just helped us win this battle. And that didn't sit very well with Saul because Saul liked to get the glory every time they won a battle. And the very next thing, he was making a monument to himself. Then it says in chapter 14, verse 46, saying Saul called back the army from chasing the Philistines. And look at that. The Philistines returned home. Too many Philistines got to go home that night. And now they've got a grudge, don't they? And now we pick it up in chapter 17, verse 1. The Philistines now mustered their army for battle. They got reinforcements. They conscripted probably people from other nations that were subservient to them. And now here they are. They've got their five sections from their five cities. And it's payback time. Do you think they're going to come with just half the force? They're going to come with everybody they've got. They've got to put this thing to bed once and for all. And they camped between Saka and Judah and Aska and Ephes to Mim. And there's a principle that comes real early on here in this text. And this is why we're going to go a little more slowly through the text. And the principle is this. When you don't deal thoroughly with what's trying to destroy you, it musters its strength and comes back. Even after you've had victories over other enemies. I mean, they had defeated the Amalekites in the previous chapter, but now something that they didn't deal with thoroughly, it came back with friends. Jesus talks about this. It's interesting. In the New Testament, Jesus, when he was speaking about, uh, he had driven a spirit out of somebody, but he was teaching his disciples about this. And, and here's what he said in, in uh, Luke uh, chapter 11. When an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert searching for rest. But when it finds none, it says, I will return to the person I came from. So it returns uh, and it finds its former home swept and, and all in order. Then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they all enter the person and live there. And that person is worse than they were before. So that principle, you've got to deal with it. The other, the other side of that is, the scripture says, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with... Yeah, all throughout the New Testament, especially in Ephesians and Colossians, it'll say, put off, okay? But then it says, put... We don't just put off, you have to replace it. And so as you're eradicating, maybe it's a bad habit in your life or, or, or something you got to deal with that. you got to put it away, and you can't leave. Uh, you know, Dave Ramsey, when he does Financial Peace University, well, what does he say? First thing you got to do is you got to cut up all your credit cards. Why? Because if Discover is here, you're not getting out of debt. Because the first time there's a problem, what are you going to do? Yeah, you're going to reach for that. And so you've you got to cut those things up if you go to Financial Peace University. And, and that's because there's this principle. Whatever you don't deal with, it's going to come back. It's going to come back with friends. Even if you've had victories in other areas of your life, just like the children of Israel. They had had victories over the Amalekites, and now something that they didn't deal with, it's coming back. In West Virginia, they say the chickens come home to roost. Do you guys say that up here? Okay, good. You're my people. I'm telling you, this is just northern West Virginia up here. <laughs> or maybe, I, maybe that's southern Pennsylvania. I don't know. Hebrews chapter 12 puts it this way. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses, speaking of those who have lived a life of faith before us, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that easily trips us up. And, uh, can you imagine if you're watching the Olympics? And, and somebody shows up to the starting gate, and they've got their warm-up suit still on. They've got some ankle weights around their ankles that they use for training. And, and, and they're ready to run in the Olympics for the gold medal, and they've got their warm-up, they, and they've got their ankle weights on. You'd say, wait, wait, stop, stop. you gotta, you got to, I mean, track, track outfits are like lightweight. They're really small. You don't run with ankle weights. And if you're trying to run the Christian life, the race that God has set before you, and you're not going to take the sin off, just not going to run effectively. You got to deal with it. Remove it. But don't just put off. Make sure you put on. 
Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Let's pick up the text again. Chapter 17, verse 1. The Philistines now mustered their army. They hadn't dealt with it, so here they come. For battle they camped at Sokah and Judah and Azkah and Ephesdemon. Saul countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the valley of Elah. So the Philistines and the Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with a valley in between them. Now there's two different perspectives here that I want us to take a look at this morning. The first is the Israelite perspective. If, if, if you're in one of those tents, or maybe you're outside of Saul's tent listening to hear what the battle plan is going to be for the, for the battle the next day, or whenever the battle is going to take place. I think if you can put yourself there and imagine that you're just sitting around one of those campfires with a couple of your buddies and you don't know if you're ever going to go home and see your family again. You're looking at this host on the other hillside. And, and if, if somebody sounds the charge and you've got to go, that might be it. And you might die a terrible death that day. And you don't know if you're going home or not. Don't you think that some of those men sitting around those campfires were grumbling a little bit? And saying, if Saul weren't such a poor leader, we wouldn't even be here. We had them. We had them on the run. We were taking them out. But we grew so tired, we, could, we couldn't even take another step because he, he wouldn't let us eat food that day. Can you imagine how those grumblings, surely they made their way back to Saul. Can you imagine how that fed into his own insecurities and things that he, the problems that he had with his insecurities? The second thing that people might have been saying around those little campfires on the Israelite side of the creek is, where's the prophet Samuel? Because you, as you recall in the very last chapter, it says Samuel didn't come to see Saul anymore. After that whole mess with the Amalekites, that was it. We, don't, we never see him anymore. Is God still with us, in other words? What, what, maybe they're saying, what if God is still angry with us because of our partial obedience in chapter 16, we only obeyed half. Remember, they were supposed to wipe out all the Amalekites and all their stuff, but what did they do? They took the best of the sheep and the best of the goats, and, and they didn't wipe them out. And, and, and I, I know if, if I was sitting around one of those fires and I'm looking across at the other side, I'm going to say, I don't want to fight those guys if God's not really with us. What if he's still angry? We don't have a, a mediator. We don't have a prophet to represent us. Maybe the last thing they thought of was, maybe Jonathan can bail us out again. At least Jonathan's here. I mean, he took on a whole garrison, he and his armor bearer, right? They, 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 they killed a dozen or so guys, and we won the battle because of them. Maybe Jonathan can bail us out again. We need a hero. Now, let's travel, let's, let's sneak across the valley, and let's imagine we're in that tent with the Philistines, and these five burly guys are sitting there. What are they thinking? What's their perspective? I think first they're saying, let's not underestimate them. We got whooped the last time. We didn't see that one coming. We underestimated them. A lot of people died in the last battle, so we got to get retribution, but we have to do it in a way that there's minimal casualties. These five lords of the Philistines cannot go back to Gath and Ekron and Gaza. They can't go back with only half of their guys because a bunch of them got killed in the battle. They just went through that a few chapters ago, probably a couple years earlier, where their armies returned home, but they returned home smaller, and, and there were a lot of fatherless homes uh, in, in those cities. And so if they're going to get payback, and if they're going to deal with the Hebrew problem, they've got to do it in a way that there's minimal casualties this time. The second thing is, the king's son Jonathan is a problem, isn't he? They've got a guy in their army who took on a whole garrison and beat it by himself. This is an enormous problem. Don't, don't you think that the, the fame of that not only spread on the Israelite side of the mountain, but they know about it on the other side of the mountain too. Thirdly, I think they would have said, we need a solution that deals with King Saul's son and gives us an opportunity to win the battle with minimal casualties. And as they're probably arguing on how to do that, I just picture the Lord of Gath pounding his fist on the table, and he says, I got the solution, guys. We got this guy that's over nine feet tall from Gath. And then we pick up the text. 
Verse 4. Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet. His bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. His, his coat of mail might have weighed more than David. He also wore bronze leg armor. He carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam. Think if somebody had a four by four post like you'd build a deck with. Okay, they rounded it off so it's four inches diameter and it's 10 feet long. The weight of that. It's a weaver's beam. And it was, it was tipped with a, with a spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. The head of this guy's spear probably weighs more than five or six spears on the other side. Tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. And Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight, he called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of... We want a king. He'll lead us in the battle. You're just the servants of Saul. I'm the Philistine champion. It's almost as if he's trying to entice one particular person to come out and fight him. Jonathan. That's not what's going to happen, though, in the story, is it? Choose a man from among you. Have him come down here and fight me. If he kills me, we'll be your slaves. Minimal casualties. If I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. Now, the logical response to such a challenge would be to send the man who had killed an entire garrison. All right? Round up Jonathan. It's go time. That's our champion. He's your champion. This is the heavyweight. Ding, ding, go. But that was not their response as we wrap things up this morning. It says in verse 11, when Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Why? Why in the world would the Israelites be terrified and deeply shaken? I mean, think about all the victories God has given them. I mean, you can go back generations to the Battle of Jericho, right? I mean, all of those. But then they can even look at very recent things that have happened. They did beat the Philistines already. They just wiped out the Amalekites. Why would these people be shaken and terrified? Well, let me ask you. Why are you ever shaken and terrified when something uh, unforeseen or something ominous is on the horizon? I, I think there's a reason why they are so fearful. And I think they are shaken because there is a rift in their relationship with God. They don't know. If, we, if somebody blows a trumpet and we charge, we don't know is God going with us or not. Because there's been a breach. We were told to do this with the Amalekites. We didn't. We didn't obey there. There's probably idol worship. There's probably all kinds of stuff going on. And these guys are like, we don't even know. Like, what's our relationship with God? Like, and because of that fear, because of that rift, it brings fear. And that brings us to our second principle this morning. We will either walk in fellowship or we will walk in fear. And there's an inverse relationship between those two things. The greater the fellowship, the less the fear. The less the fellowship, the greater the fear. And this principle is borne out in Scripture. Now, I'm not talking about a healthy respect for adverse situations, okay? If I'm up high on a ladder, I hold on with both hands. I, I, don't, I don't see if I can balance on one foot at the top of a ladder. Why? Because I don't want to fall. So, but, but I'm talking about life decision-making, living in fear of, of just everything, or even fear of particular circumstances, when, when you're walking in fellowship with God, the fear reduces. And when you're not walking in fellowship, the fear increases. And I've had this experience happen in my own life. Maybe some of you can, can identify. I've been in situations on a missions trip or even in, in ministry situations where I was in neighborhoods that were very uh, difficult, scary kind of places to be, places I wouldn't normally go with my family and walk around. 
and, and had zero fear in that moment. Why? Because I knew, hey, I'm, the Lord has me here for a reason. I'm supposed to be in this place at this time. I have no reason to be afraid. And, and so there was this, this inverse relationship, and I'm just using that as an illustration between fear and fellowship. And when we have fellowship with God and our fellowship is unbroken, we find fear fleeing. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28 says this, Now, dear children, remain in fellowship with Christ, so that when He returns, you will be full of... Isn't that interesting? See this relationship. Fellowship brings courage. You will not shrink back from Him in shame. You'll look forward to the day Christ comes. If, if you heard a knock at your door and, and Jesus was standing there, would you have to straighten up a few things in the house before he comes in? Or would you be like, Jesus, you're here. This is the most awesome day ever. Come on in. However, if you're not walking with the Lord and, and you know things aren't right and Jesus shows up at your door, you're kind of like, uh, can you wait on the porch for about 10 minutes? Some stuff i got to take care of real quick. Fellowship. Remain in fellowship with Christ. Live in a constant state of fellowship with Christ so that when he returns, you'll be full of courage and not shrink back from him in shame. It, it's the opposite of what happens in Genesis. Genesis chapter 3 is the account of the fall of man. And, and what happens there is that mankind falls into sin. And, and every day before that, God came to the garden in the cool of the day and they had this great time with their creator and they would talk about the events and what they had discovered throughout the day, what they had done. But then this one day, God comes to the garden and he says, Adam. And the scripture says, after there's the confrontation, Adam replies, I heard you walking in the garden, and I, so I hid because I was. See, the fellowship had been broken, and now there is fear. So what's the takeaway from this passage this morning as we're just going to break this into a little bit smaller chunks as we walk through this wonderful story that probably everybody knows of David and Goliath? The first is this, that we must deal with the enemy of sin thoroughly. But in all honesty, we fall short. We need someone who will deal with our enemy of sin on our behalf, just like they were hoping that Samuel might arrive or hoping that a champion would arrive. Well, this, this story is setting up the narrative because someone does arrive on the scene a couple of, about a thousand years after this who deals with our enemy of sin, and that's the Messiah. We need somebody to deal with the enemy on our behalf. Secondly, walk in fellowship or you'll walk in fear. Every morning when you wake up, Lord, this is your day. Every day is the Lord's day, not just Sunday. Every, Lord, this is your day. Uh, if I'm going to work, I'm going to school, or it's a day off and I've just got some things I want to get done. Lord, this is your day. And, and I want to walk in fellowship with you throughout this day. When I put my head on the pillow at night, I want to say, wow, this was a great day. There was nothing between us. And when we wake up the next day, it's the same thing. Walking in fellowship with God. If we don't walk in fellowship, we will walk in fear. Lord, I pray that you would help us to walk in fellowship with you. May the fear subside as we draw closer and closer to you. Lord, all of us at times struggle with different sins and, and, and putting things away and putting things off. So I pray that you'd help us to deal with sin thoroughly so it doesn't come back and get us. For the scripture says, be sure your sin will find you out. Lord, I thank you that you have dealt with sin at the cross, that we might find forgiveness, that we can confess our sins, and you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness so that our fellowship might be restored and we might walk in fellowship and not fear. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.